At dawn, somewhere deep within the Mekong River Delta, a South Vietnamese river assault group moves against the Viet Cong. With it goes a young American Navy lieutenant. He serves in a guerrilla war of seek and destroy. Yet here, far from destroyer and aircraft carrier, he is the American Navy in Vietnam. On Yankee Station, somewhere in the South China Sea, another more familiar view of the American Navy in Vietnam. The mammoth Kitty Hawk, second largest of U.S. attack carriers, turns into the wind to launch its airborne striking force. Not far away along the coast, other units of the U.S. 7th Fleet take careful aim, on call from troops fighting ashore, and place supporting fire on Viet Cong concentrations. Farther south, another kind of armed strength prepares to go ashore. The most effective means known for gaining and holding a piece of ground. The individual fighting man, the United States Marine. It's a packed billeting office, uh, Alan speaking. Can I help you, sir? Inland at Saigon, a Navy chief works at a different kind of job. Less glamorous, but vitally important. Nichols, the assignment desk clerk will help you, sir. Behind the guns and planes and fighting men is a staff of Navy, Army, and Air Force personnel who administer support activities for Allied forces throughout the country. And your date you're in Vietnam, sir? 3 August. 3 August. Here, this is for the baby. East of Saigon, at a small village near the coast, these men have gone beyond their basic mission of military action to launch an equally important campaign of civic action, another side of the American Navy in Vietnam. To these men, their work on projects which will result in civic achievement is just as important as the work their shipmates do in more conventional naval surroundings. I'm Chet Huntley. To most of us, this is the United States Navy. The aircraft carrier, the cruiser, and destroyer. The modern deep water Navy, extending American strength across the oceans of the world. But in Vietnam, the American Navy has done an unprecedented variety of different jobs. It has held command responsibility for all support activities. With the Army, it has been advisor to the South Vietnamese and has sent the Marines to help fight the land war. With the Air Force, it flies the planes which provide air power. And with civilian agencies, it pursues a vigorous program of civic action. These are the all-around capabilities demonstrated by a modern, versatile naval force in action. The American Navy in Vietnam. July 1964. Off the coast of Vietnam, units of the United States 7th Fleet patrol the waters of the South China Sea. To help the people of South Vietnam defend themselves against the threat of an armed communist takeover, the United States and other countries have begun a flow of economic, technical and financial aid. A joint civilian military effort to build a stronger nation. A small but dedicated South Vietnamese Navy is hard at work in an effort to deny the use of the rivers and coastal waters as supply routes for the Viet Cong. 
To bring knowledge of new techniques which can increase efficiency, a United States Military Assistance Command has been established. American Navy advisors work with the Vietnamese and help in many phases of training. Head Supact, the United States Navy Headquarters Support Activity, has been established in Saigon. Already in mid-1964, the American Navy is in Vietnam. At the end of July 1964, the United States Military Assistance Command reports an increase in Viet Cong forces in South Vietnam. Then the Navy's role in Vietnam suddenly expands. On August 2nd, the United States Navy destroyer Maddox, on patrol in international waters of the Gulf of Tonkin, begins to track three unknown craft approaching from the northwest. They are identified as North Vietnamese PT boats, armed with torpedoes and 37mm guns. When warnings from the Maddox fail to stop the oncoming PT boats, she opens fire. The attack prompts the United States to strengthen its ready defense capabilities. The destroyer was carrying out a, a mission of patrol in those waters, in international waters. When it was attacked, it replied to the attack continued to carry out its mission today and will do so the remainder of this week. In the same waters, the President has asked that the destroyer force be doubled and that an air cap, a combat air patrol, be available at all times on call to it. And as I think you know, he's issued instructions that in the event of a further attack upon our vessels in international waters, we are to respond with the objective of destroying the attackers. The Maddox, joined by the destroyer Sea Turner Joy, resumes its routine patrol. But the next night, the men on watch and the two destroyers once again detect unidentified contacts on radar. The attack by the North Vietnamese boats is renewed. After a three-hour running battle in which two of the PT boats are sunk, the attackers break contact. My fellow Americans, as President and Commander-in-Chief, it is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. The performance of commanders and crews in this engagement is in the highest tradition of the United States Navy. But repeated acts of violence against the armed forces of the United States must be met not only with alert defense, but with positive reply. By the end of March 1965, air operations from Navy carriers in the South China Sea are underway on a daily basis. Also in March, in Operation Dagger Thrust, an integrated Navy Marine Corps effort, 7th Fleet Marines land at Da Nang, then at Chu Lai, and later on the Vung Mu Peninsula. On land, the Allied forces fight to turn the tide of conflict from a retreating defense against guerrilla attacks to an offensive strategy designed to defeat the Viet Cong. During 1965, the United States Navy, with its ability to move quickly on short notice, is called upon to reinforce the United States position. In the short time since the Tonkin Gulf incident, American naval power rapidly expands from a supporting role to a full-fledged naval task force. Embodied in the forces of the United States 7th Fleet is almost every facet of modern naval power. Cruisers like the USS Canberra are built for fast speeds and long endurance. The destroyer, indispensable to any naval action, is the workhorse of the fleet. The USS Bainbridge, a destroyer leader, is largest of the destroyer class, the world's first nuclear-powered guided missile frigate. Both cruisers and destroyers, in addition to their traditional deep water roles, have been called upon to play a special role in Vietnam. Delta, this is Gamma 26 Charlie. 
target number 201, bearing 13... Whenever the need arises, ships of the 7th Fleet move quickly into position along the coast of Vietnam. Take their directions from a forward air controller or spotter who is in visual contact with the enemy. Fire for effect, over. This is naval gunfire support, a mobile source of big gun reinforcement for friendly troops ashore. Meanwhile, standing farther offshore is the heart of the fighting fleet. In Vietnam, as never before, the aircraft carrier has proven her worth. From the huge Kitty Hawk to the even larger nuclear-powered Enterprise, the Navy's attack carriers have held the balance of power. Stand by to start. We have four, the A-6s, the A-1, and the A-3. Stand clear of the jet intakes and exhausts on the A-4s. You're clear to start. The A-4s, the A-6s, the A-1, and the A-3. Fast, mobile, independent of political boundaries and agreements, the carrier can ready her flight deck on short notice, launch her air power as required. The modern attack carrier is a carefully coordinated organization of countless complex pieces of hardware and of hundreds of men who make the hardware work. Three main eye. Smoke watch for black smoke, three alpha boiler. All right, clear the stacks up, Roger. From yeoman to machinist's mate, many of the men below decks work at the important traditional jobs, familiar in naval ships throughout the world. What is the IFF on contact 330? Other men must master newer skills and disciplines required by new technologies. In the Combat Information Center, equipped with the latest facilities for rapid communication and data handling, a complete picture of the surrounding tactical situation is kept up to the minute by sophisticated electronic and computerized systems. Your pigeons, one, six, zero, 80 miles, steer home plate, over. In other spaces and compartments, the carrier is equipped to keep almost anything she carries, from a coffee pot to complex avionics gear in combat ready condition. This event uh, 7 Delta will be uh, running the Route 14 route recce from Pleiku down to Ben Mateau. There should be uh, automatic weapons along the route. There's some artillery fire down just north of Ben Mateau. In a sense, the final responsibility for the success of the carrier's mission rests with a small group of men whose job is to master the intricate operation of a million dollar fighting machine, the modern jet aircraft. Okay, everybody get your radios and get the data down off the board here and you'll be ready to man them. The carrier's primary mission is to put these men and their planes in the air and on target. Her mix of fighters, attack aircraft and reconnaissance planes extends the carrier's strength for hundreds of miles. seek out the enemy's strong points and selectively place striking power on targets where it will be most effective. Enemy supply routes and storage depots, dams and airfields, barracks and troop concentrations. One of the best examples of the range and flexibility of naval power is the modern amphibious operation, a coordinated Navy Marine Corps action designed to bring force in readiness wherever it's needed, put it ashore, and hold a piece of ground. In the years since World War II, amphibious landing techniques have been refined, modernized, and speeded up. In Vietnam, amphibious assaults by forces of the United States 7th Fleet have driven the Viet Cong from many strongholds along the coast.
It is typical of the cooperative effort in Vietnam that in this operation, a Navy amphibious ship provides a landing platform and fresh ammunition for Army helicopters, which will provide air support for United States and South Vietnamese soldiers and Marines on shore. One of the newest concepts in strike warfare is built around the LPH, or Amphibious Assault Ship, a completely equipped floating helicopter base with complete facilities for the service and control of an airborne assault. Bravo 8-1, this is Clearwater. Roger, your pigeons to Point Cairo, 28014, over. Uh, this is 8-1, Roger out. Introduction of the helicopter to amphibious operations has precipitated the greatest single tactical innovation since the Second World War, the technique of vertical envelopment. Marines are swiftly airlifted to land behind enemy positions, while the rest of the force assaults the beach. Completion of the mission is in the hands of the Fleet Marine, the Navy's most competent means of extending its power inland. It may be that the most unusual thing about the American Navy in Vietnam is the fact that it has played such an important role in Vietnam. The fact that the Navy, while it has carried out a wide range of assignments at sea, has also contributed heavily to the effort along the coast, in the rivers, and on shore. One of the most important jobs is the continuing patrol of Vietnamese coastal waters. Airborne patrols are flown day and night, around the clock, to ensure against infiltration of supplies and ammunition from the north. Clean cut. This is Bluebird, 3-0. Large cargo jump to position X-ray, Romeo, 7386. Request surface units investigate. Bluebird, 3-0. This is Clean Cut. Roger out. Suspicious contact report, sir. Very well, thank you. In Saigon, at the command center of U.S. Naval Forces, Vietnam, naval activities throughout the country are coordinated. Uh, Mr. Epling? Uh, Bluebird 30 aircraft has a suspicious contact here in the restricted zone. He says it's a large. One of the major of efforts of this command is Operation Market Time, the Navy's name for the important task of coastal surveillance. We have a destroyer and a WPB in the area. I recommend we send the destroyer down there to investigate this contact. In this case, a destroyer escort is assigned to examine a suspicious contact reported by air patrol. Vietnamese Navy liaison officers assigned to each American ship check identity papers and cargo manifests to be certain that an innocent cargo of fish or rice does not conceal Viet Cong guns, supplies and ammunition, holds are open and inspected. Each day brings thousands of fishing and cargo junks to the river and coastal waters of Vietnam. The enormous task of Operation Market Time is to guard against the use of this normal marketing activity as a cover for smuggling and infiltration by the Viet Cong. In addition to destroyers and minesweepers, Market Time patrols are conducted by high-speed patrol craft called Swift Boats and by cutters of the United States Coast Guard whose crews are well experienced in this kind of work. One of the newest additions to the patrol efforts in Vietnam is the Navy's PBR. The PBR is a 31-foot, plastic-hulled, water-jet-propelled craft designed for high-speed operation in very shallow water. Quiet and highly maneuverable, it is used in Operation Game Warden, whose mission is to prohibit all Viet Cong movement in the Mekong River Delta. Patrols along the coast are coordinated with the Vietnamese Navy through its regional coastal surveillance centers. 
just as naval activities at all levels are coordinated between American and Vietnamese. Can Tho on the Basak River is headquarters for Vietnamese River Assault Group 25. Here and at other bases throughout the country, officers and men of the United States Naval Advisory Group perform one of the most important roles of the American Navy in Vietnam. Side by side with his Vietnamese counterpart, the American advisor helps to fulfill the mission of the River Assault Group to deny the waterways and hiding places of the Mekong Delta to the Viet Cong. Uh, we, I suggest we alert the uh, Iraq patrols to keep a careful eye on this area for the next couple nights. Yeah. A typical operation begins shortly after midnight as troops load aboard the assault boats and start upriver. By the next morning, the assault group, which has moved several miles upriver to close with the Viet Cong force, launches its attack. In terms of numbers, these men who ride the river assault boats are few. In terms of the overall Navy commitment, their contribution is great. At a junk force base in the Delta near the small fishing village of Tiem Tom, another U.S. Naval advisor lives and works day in, day out with the men of Vietnamese Coastal Group 37. With his counterpart, the base commander, he takes part in every phase of the daily routine. <laughs> Together, they carry out the daily patrols, constantly checking against the possible infiltration of Viet Cong supplies on the river waterways. Together, they share the meals prepared by the commander's wife. What are we having for dinner tonight? Yeah. Chicken. Chicken. Uh, What's the Vietnamese name for this again? Chun Gay. Chun Gay. Chun Gay. Chun Gay. Chun Gay. Okay, well, it's Spanish omelet to me. Always be Spanish omelet. Together, they relax when time permits, discuss their work, and the small matters of personal concern, which often seem insignificant but which helped to bridge the gap between their two widely separated worlds. Other advisors at the Vietnamese naval shipyard in Saigon put their experience and skills to work, contribute their knowledge of improved shipbuilding techniques and new construction materials, develop procedures to help increase shipyard efficiency. At Chu Lai and Da Nang, at Tai Ninh and Pleiku, from the Delta to the Central Highlands, the Seabees, naval construction experts, are at work on a wide variety of vital projects. Often working behind the scenes, the Seabees don't make headlines. But without the things they do make, the headlines might never appear. From airfields and roads to hospitals and storage depots, the Navy construction battalions move from project to project pursuing the accomplishment of their CB motto, Can Do. In addition to the CBs, the Navy also staffs the OICC, Officer in Charge of Construction, which supervises civilian contractors in the world's largest single construction program. The OICC plans and builds military facilities throughout the country. At Saigon, the Navy has established the major medical facility for United States and Allied personnel. The quality of medical service in Vietnam has reduced mortality from battlefield casualties to an unprecedented low. By the end of 1965, Head Act, the in-country support activity, has grown into the Navy's largest single overseas shore command. And by June 1966, when it has been officially turned over to the Army, it is serving as chauffeur, 
mechanic, administrator, electrician, doctor, and policeman. It is generating electric power, providing warehouse facilities, operating an airline, and performing other services for thousands of allied personnel. To the north, at the port city of Da Nang, another United States naval support activity has been activated and is growing rapidly. These facilities, which will meet the demands of an expanded logistics support operation, include provisions for another large naval hospital. For the officers and men of the Navy and Marine Corps who serve on shore, the campaign in Vietnam is not only military in nature. CB technical assistance teams have helped with scores of civilian projects which will improve conditions for the South Vietnamese people. Roads, bridges, buildings, security hamlets to provide safety from Viet Cong terrorism. Clinics conducted by Navy doctors, dentists and corpsmen have brought medical treatment and supplies to areas where they might otherwise never have been. Through people-to-people -people projects of many kinds, these men are working to win the confidence and restore the hopes of the Vietnamese through joint civilian military action. This too is the American Navy in Vietnam. In terms of the variety and scope of the experience, Vietnam has already written a new chapter in the annals of naval history. Never before has the potential of the Navy Marine team been so fully realized. And yet, one important thing remains unchanged. The success of the overall effort will rely, as it always has, upon the acts of the individual man. Whatever credit is due will rest with many thousands of individual men who stand behind the aircraft, the ships, the boats, and the rifles, from the Delta to the South China Sea. And whether he serves ashore, or in the rivers and coastal waters, at sea or in the skies above, he will shoulder the responsibility for final success or failure. And he will be the one to make the needed sacrifice. And it is important to remember that no matter what his job or where his duty, he is the Navy's greatest single asset, the individual man. This is the American Navy in Vietnam, moving quickly where and when needed displaying the flexibility of modern sea power, controlling the seas, extending its influence on land, and holding superiority in the air, a three-way force for peace geared to meet aggression at any spot on the globe.